Welcome back to the Locker Room Podcast, podcast number 39. Uh, just before we get into speaking with our, our guest today, Jim McCory, who's got 30, 35 years of coaching and managing experience, uh, I would like to thank our sponsors, Ripped.app. Uh, they're a platform that aids sports scientists and SNC coaches in tracking their athletes remotely to improve performance. Uh, we use them here uh, extensively at Daily Sports Science. Uh, so a big thanks uh, to our sponsors, Ripped.app. I'm joined today uh, by two people. First of all, I'm, I'm joined by my co-host today, Stephen Poocher. Uh, Stephen, uh, you're very welcome on the show today. Uh, just before we, we introduce our, our guest, Stevie, um, the National League fixtures were released there. I think they were just released a few hours ago. And also in, in the six counties as well. Club football's back in the six counties too, Stevie. Uh, so you know it, it's it's great that we're getting back back to a bit of normality. Yeah, Joe, uh, we better light at the end of the tunnel, hopefully for everyone. Um, I, I just I haven't actually seen the fixtures yet, so I'm not sure uh, what the what the lay of the land is. I think I know it's the 16th, 23rd, and 30th of May, so it gives people something to look forward to. But I thought Joe maybe the GA might have missed a trick, and I'm sure we'll hear Jim's thoughts on it now in a second, but. Well, maybe the provincial championships this year, above all years, it was an opportunity maybe to possibly uh, maybe just go a different direction, you know, and with maybe play the National League as a whole, because there's going to be five games anyway in the National League, but play the National League as a whole and then maybe have a unique 32 county championship where you maybe just throw the names in a hat, no seeding, and just throw it out, knockout championship, just as a one-off, just, just with the times that we're in, because they are talking about obviously run the championship off very quickly. And you would have had it run off, obviously, in three, four, five weeks. And football obviously would have had everybody at the exact same time. But, Joe, my honest opinion is, and I mean this, and I'm, I'm obviously involved for the county this year, but my honest opinion is, and I mean this genuinely, is I think the club player has been let down a little bit, uh, you know, from, from the point of view being that I feel there's still going to be a bit of waiting around and, and you know, on your your county to get knocked out before you have your county players back and before your leagues can start and I don't know what way it's going to work for certain counties but I'm still a bit left about it I felt that it was a great opportunity just to split the season in two Joe and have two you know clearly defined seasons and I think Joe what we need to do as well as we'll talk about it later in the show when, when I'm going to get Jim's thoughts on it is I think we really need to look at regulating the volume of training to games ratio that we have at the minute in Gaelic football, Joe. I think it's absolutely, it's just astounding. And I wrote a piece on it this week where uh, Dermot Simpson, the Donegal physio in 2011, in 2015, talked about they had something like training sessions to matches, 10 training sessions to one match. And 68% of their injuries were accumulated during training. And that's nothing to do with their training. That's nothing to do with Donegal, by the way. That's just an example of uh, the system you know, the structure and what's wrong with it, you know. So, but we'll get Jim's views on it anyway later and we'll, we'll see what we think on that, you know. Brilliant stuff, Stevie. Um, okay, so so as Stevie said, we, we've got um, a, a brilliant person on today. We've got Jim McCory on today. Uh, Jim's um, Jim's had over 30 years of GAA coaching and management experience and, and Jim's worked at uh, county level. He's managed and he's coached at county level, both Armagh and Down. And also at, at club level, he's managed top teams. He's managed my old team, uh, Mayo Bridge. He's managed Kilku. And I think at the minute, uh, Jim, you're, you're with Bourne. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. Thanks yep. for coming on. Back into the club scene. Unlike your co host there, who's left the club scene um, and moved to county, I went the opposite way, you know. So I've left the, the pressure cooker into the local pressure cooker, and Stevie's went into the Back into, into that scene. So, uh, yeah, back in the burn, back in the, in the down as well. So, uh, after a few years ago. Uh, did I not sign a disclaimer before this to speak? To say, well, to speak with that, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Well, the only thing I'd say, Stevie, there's been two big names this week. Um, Mourinho was one of them, and you were the other one. So, uh, I mean, big clubs, big names, big money. Those guys are all gone now. So, I'm glad I, I'm, I'm sort of laying low at the minute, sort of under the radar. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant stuff, uh, Jim. I think you're back tomorrow night uh, in full squad training. Well, maybe maybe you guys aren't back tomorrow night, but I think that's the official word from the Ulster GAA. Yeah, the the clubs end of it uh, were allowed back in the north um, last Monday for 15s, 
um, but you couldn't any more fifteen, including the coaches on the playing uh, field. And then from tomorrow night, it's uh, full fifteen v fifteen, no more than a hundred in the grounds uh, in the north again, because obviously the counties in the south still don't have that approval from Crow Park. So um, yeah, we're we're back into that, and it'd be nice to be able to start getting fifteen aside. You know, Stevie says, I mean, gay players play football, you know, to enjoy and to win after the competition. You know, that's what they're there for. They're not there to be doing drills, whether they're good drills or bad drills. Uh, or to have the legs run off them. They're, they want to play competitive games and have that challenge, you know. So it's nice that we're moving quickly on it. And I have to say, in fairness, you know, there's been a fair bit of uh, controversy and criticism about the GA. Overall, you know, considering we faced a pandemic, something that we'd never seen before that's affected the economy, affected families, uh, affected businesses across the whole lot, you know, to actually get through last year and to be back in again now, you know, on the such really tough conditions, you know. I think actually they'll be to be applauded rather than it's sort of uh, denigrated for what they've done, to be honest. And I know things weren't 100% right, and there were different announcements one week saying, you know, we'll call me back within two weeks, and then I was knocked on the head on RT sports, stuff like that. So maybe a wee bit of communication was pure on it, but considering where we were and where we were even four months ago to where we are now, being able this Friday night at a club level to have full 15 aside. Uh, Training games and games, you know that that's a big positive for me. And Jim, Jim, just on just on that as well, just back up what you're saying there. And I think you're completely right. You know, I think Joe, we we lived through something that was that was only happened a hundred years ago. You know, so nobody nobody had any experience of this, right? And nobody knew what the best approach was. What what tired me out at the end of it was what you would probably call the COVID police. That you know anybody that stepped out of line of COVID protocols, people love to jump on it and make hysteria about it. And I don't think people actually stood back and looked at the bigger picture. What harm are a group of lads out in the field doing when you have 30 kids, that I have 30 children and you have Joe as a teacher every single day in a small room with poor ventilation and all schools are exactly the same and you're being told, oh, this is completely safe, but you're not allowed outside for PE in more than 15. I hear that's what's frustrating, you know, it was the sort of the mixed messages and the, and the sort of contradictory messages, but I think you know, common sense has prevailed, Jim, at this stage, and I think it's vitally important, even for young people's, you know, mental health and well-being, that they're back out playing football. And, and, and I'm delighted to see, Jim. I think tonight it did get the green light that underage and senior football can go ahead in full squads because young people, uh, men, need it more than anybody because they're they're they've been living in a box this last, you know, six seven months. So it is it is a big relief, Joe. It is like you know, <clears throat> absolutely. Okay, um, Jim, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll just go back to um, the, the early part of your career. As I, as I said there, I think you were manager of uh, Armagh sort of towards the, the earlier part of your career. And you, um, you actually won, or you got to the final, sorry, of the National League. It was 1994. Um, and I think 25 years later, you, you were the coach of Armagh, which was last year, a few years ago. Um, what, in your view, has kind of... Even your even your coaching journey. What was your coaching journey even before that, or why did you get into coaching and GA coaching? Yeah, well, suppose uh, I've always been sport mad. Even though my career wasn't always sort of moving towards sport uh, from a professional point of view, um, everything that I did revolved around sport. And um, my first degree when I went to Queens, you just done an ordinary undergraduate degree. Um, Went to Canada, then did a master's, and it was a great opportunity over there. I mean, I played a bit of rugby, played Canadian football, played soccer, played the university team as well, soccer, which showed how bad they are. I remember I get the place on the soccer team. Um, but, you know, fantastic facilities, uh, everything geared, you know, towards sport it was fantastic. Came back home and um, applied for a job in the leisure centre in Craig Avon. Uh, I remember thinking of no chance of getting it, and then I got that job. And the fact that I was actually working as a recreation or assistant manager at the leisure centre was the first job all those years ago. What's that? Maybe 34 years, 35 years ago now. Um, to actually be working in that environment was fantastic as well. But I'd always had a great interest in uh, fitness and um, keeping fit, uh, using weights, uh, the whole nutritional end of it. Uh, I actually remember coming back when I was in Canada and coming back and um, trying to advise the Armagh players of that era, you know, the Joe Kernans and Jimmy Smiths and Colin McKenzie's of this world, you know, I was just 
follow the new year, bring up about sport now, you know, been away. And, but even the simple thing like taking bananas, you know, which you see the tennis players and all doing right and stuff like that. I remember the guys laughing at because after training, you would have got, you know, you'd have been in the, uh, the hotel in, in Armagh and you'd have got the local hotel, just the wee woman that ran it. And you'd had your uh, your soda bread and a pot of tea, you know, a big whack of butter on it. That was our sort of post-match meals on it. So I remember having laughed at that. But that, my whole background, uh, work and enjoyment in life revolved around sport. Uh, and then I was asked to uh, take over Kalibi. Uh, shortly after I retired, I had a knee injury, I got an operation on it, I got a knee re injured again, uh, took on Kalibi, and then Father Hargitay asked me to come in with him with Armagh. He was going to manage him that time in, in 91. Uh, Joe Kieran and Paddy Moriarty were in charge of it before then. And um, they asked me, uh, he asked me to come in and be system manager trainer for them, which I agreed to do. And then Father Hargitay, God rest him, he couldn't do it. So they asked me would I take it on, much to my surprise, after just two years at, at club level. Uh, but it was a great challenge and I took it on and that was the start of the career in, in coaching from, from, from there it went from you know four years with Armagh two years with Armagh Miners as well uh, a year with Down and I had uh, three years with Armagh recently as assistant manager with Kieran McGinney so I had, a, I had a fair number of years coaching that, that sort of elite level that we're talking about Stevie's now with, with Roscommon um, and then in between all those years with clubs, uh, your own club, Mayo Bridge, Kilcoo, Drumgath, uh, Clondoff, um, and now in with Burn. So, yeah, that's really been the background as to how I got involved with sport and involved with coaching. And uh, fortunately enough, you know, I've had a fair degree of success over the years. So I've supposedly managed to stay in coaching because of that. Uh, to, to be thrown in there, Jim, you know, as, as Armagh, as a county manager there back in 1994, that must have been... Uh, you know, a, a steep learning curve after, you know, a relatively, you know, only a few years of kind of coaching experience. How, how did you kind of approach approach that one? Yeah, from the football management point of view um, and the coaching, uh, you know, Armagh were a fairly low ebb at that time um, in fairness. And I remember uh, when I met the exact committee that said to me, and I've said this before, you know, that I was inheriting the worst panel of players ever as a manager. And I've got develop and bring the whole thing forward, that would be a success. Um, and I, because I had worked in the, uh, in the whole, my whole background was working in, in sport, I had fair access to sports facilities and through the Sports Council, um, I brought in a whole development program um, for, uh, for Arma. We brought in uh, sports psychologist, uh, nutritionist, strength conditioning coach, um, and there were four we brought in at that time, which really was unheard of, even at county level. And Stevie probably, maybe Stevie's a wee bit younger than me, might even remember this, but you probably, you wouldn't have heard a lot of this at uh, county level way back then. Uh, now, of course, there's backroom teams, there's coaches for everything and advisors for everything on it. In fact, some of the best clubs now are really as good as what counties are. So I had a good... Uh, I had a good understanding of what was needed from the sports science point of view to move it forward. Obviously, you need to play in personnel, so we made a lot of changes in terms of bringing in the young minors of, of that time. You know, the Barry O'Hagan, David Morrison, Paul McGrain, Oshie McConville, guys like that, that were brought in at a young age. That was a very good, successful uh, minor team that won the All-Ireland. So we brought them in and integrated them in fairly early in their careers um, and tried to, tried to bring that all together. The other big, big factor for me was... Uh, I brought in a terrific coach and a great friend and John Morrison, God rest him, who's now passed a uh, fantastic person, um, real uh, hub of activity whenever John's on the field. Uh, he was ahead of his time, of course, and what he did. And even right up until his passing, he was ahead of his time and some of his thinking in football and the psychology and that whole end of it that he developed. So um, I had a great management team with me. Um, I had a great county board who were backing me at the time. We brought in the young players and we brought in the sports science to try and bring it along. And to everyone's surprise, we got through the National League final. Um, we won the McKenna Cup during that period as well. Um, I think it was Darren Stevie, you might have beaten that one, so you probably wouldn't remember that. You might have been there in the stands. So we fell out, but I think you might have been about 18 or 19 at that time, Stevie. I was only 90, 93. Was... <laughs> Jesus, Jesus, Jim, 93. I was only, I was only 13 or 14. <laughs> there, so Stevie, was... um, yeah, Stevie. I think John Morrison was kind of like a, he was kind of a mentor to you. You knew him well as, as well, didn't you? Um, 
Who how much did that know? help? How much does it help to have a have a person like that? No, who who didn't know? You know, and that, that was the thing. And Jim, you would probably agree with me here, Jim. It's a, like you nearly thought, and this is John's greatest asset. You, know, you nearly thought that you were unique because John would have made contact with you so often, and you know, would have wished you all the best, and would have sent you a happy Christmas message and a happy Easter and the whole lot. And like one of the first messages I had on my phone, like I'll never forget, even the day they came off the field against when Carlo beat the a brilliant day for me as a coach, like you know, and. Like you're coming on the field, the first message on your phone from John, like you know what I mean, and, and you're just going yourself. This is like, why, how's this man? You know, and it was only really probably Joe when only really when John died that I actually was just completely overwhelmed with a volume of people who would have received the exact same message that I would have received. Or, well, I know Jim had probably a, a, a closer relationship with him, but you always felt that you had a great relationship. And, and to be fair now, him at the very start of, of, of my coaching journey. Uh, Joe, come back, come back to 2008, right, 2007, when, when when things were going well with the school, like started getting involved in coaching and things like that as well. And look, I wasn't enjoying playing and injuries and the likes of that. And I was only 30 at the time, or whatever. But I got involved in coaching very young. And I remember going to a coach education night gym in Armagh and just across from where, where, where John lives in the cathedral grounds, or just there was a 3G pitch. And like the stuff that he did in 2008. <laughs> 13 years later, I would still do, you know, and you reinvent and you make and switch about and you do it, you adapt or use whatever numbers you have or whatever you think. But like his stuff's never outdated, Jim. And that was the beauty of it. Like he was so far, as you say, ahead of his time. And probably I think, and I think, I mean, this Joe, I don't think he got the credit he deserved. You know, I think, I think, you know, uh, uh, people, as Jim said, you know, people don't like change, they don't like innovation, you know, they don't like if someone uses a, a sexy term in coaching, it's, oh, you know, what is that there? It's all about the basics, blah, blah, blah. But John was such an innovator and he would ring you up just regularly and say, here, I have an idea for you. And, and he'd be on the phone for 20 minutes and, and you wouldn't speak. It would just be him talking, you know, and I, I, listen, he was just, he was a wonderful man, a, a brilliant fella. And look, he, he gave me all his notes that he had with Mayo in 2005. And I thought I was the only one that got them. And sure, when, it, when he passed away, I realised about 2,000 people had them. You know? <laughs> and I said, this man, this is his notes. But he, he was class. He was class. Yeah. And, Marie called in one day, the wife called into the house one day in Armada to collect the book off him like and he just penned in the inside of it. It's simple words, simple words. He says, Stephen, always remember players won't care what you know until they know that you care. And I and I've always sort of carried that mantle with me in the fact that you know I like building relationships with players, you know, getting to know them as people rather than players, uh, 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 Jim, you know, and it, I think that helps. You know, when players see that you care, Joe, and that they're there for the right reasons, etc., you know, it does make a difference. And, John, John was a phenomenal character, like you know, phenomenal. Yeah, a great time, a great time you see for everybody, uh, Stevie. You know, and I was, uh, no matter who it was, uh, that's why whenever he passed, you know, it's usual, it's usual old saying, you know, whenever people pass, you're appreciated so much more. And but in his case, you know, uh, I mean, they came from everywhere to, to, to pay their respects because he had so much time for everyone. And when he spoke to you, he made you feel you were very, very important. I did, and that's just a gift that he had. But he was also a very, very intelligent man. So as well as the current end of it, he knew what he was talking about as well. Uh, and people would have laughed at some of the stuff he would have done. But the bottom line was, you look at the results, uh, and the results were always there with him. So a uh, great legacy to have, of course. Yeah. Um, just moving on, lads. Um, we, we talked there about, you know, Stevie, you, you talked a little bit about how coaching has changed um, over the last, you know, 10, 15 years. Uh, Jim, from those early days in, in sort of early 90s, coming up to kind of, you know, your, your coaching with the RMA squad under uh, Kieran McGinney there, what do you think kind of has, or even your, actually your philosophy, how has your philosophy changed or your approach to coaching or has it changed? Well, I mean, the, the philosophy end of it hasn't really changed, you know, and I mean, you hear all these terms, you know, coaching philosophies and uh, all these different game plans and football and all these different terms, you know, transitions and, um, you know, the, the different tactical uh, talk that you would hear a lot of the times from, and even some of the stuff Stevie would do there, which is quite good, of course, you know, but I'm going to run the man down, but uh, you see some of the stuff that they talk about now, you know, which all the different terms, but the, the game really hasn't changed that much. Um, but you do, I think an awful lot of coaches um, maybe try to make it more, sound more complicated than what it is, you know, and you, as I say, you know, that would be one of the biggest changes that's come through on. Of course, as I said, you like in the early 90s, you know, I brought sports science in there in mind and would still rely on it. But when I rely on it, rely on it from an evidence point of view, I mean, GPS is great. 
Uh, I remember some reports we were getting on GPS uh, in Kilku uh, and with Armagh, and there was, that, there was that much information you're looking at it and you're going, really, is somebody going to sit down and dissect all this and go through all the different reports that's on it? Performance analysis reports now as well. You may be getting 16 pages of performance analysis reports or game analysis, you know, and you, so there's so much information coming through. And that's probably the biggest change for me that from the old days or from the initial days where we're very much your basic uh, recording of performance in games done manually, then watching the game on an old video um, to now having this sort of... Uh, vast amount of information some of it that really probably people don't look at but it's all part of the, the package that comes through i like to think in terms of if you want to record something you want to use it as part of your analysis you really want to have a benefit from it and that players can understand and take a benefit from it so that's probably the biggest change for me is the way it's become i like evidence-based decision making but it's went very much uh, overload probably might be a, a way to describe it and then the other aspect to it as well, a lot of things from the business world you find coming into uh, the coaching of football teams and you see the whole aspect that like you never would have heard of a, of a mission statement or you never would have heard of a vision in football. You never would have heard of values and um, you know behaviours and the fact that although if you don't do it now, there's something seriously wrong. You haven't got a you haven't got a culture within your team. As a coach, you haven't got that philosophy. You know, philosophy for me way, way back would only have been like a course you would have done at Queen's, the philosophy of, of science, you know, and our are in these guys, you know, but now with philosophies of football and everything as well. So it's, you know, you go, for me, you, you, you watch a game as a coach and what you observe, you want to have evidence to back up some of the decision making, especially when you're talking to players on it. But it's very, very hard to go past the observation as a coach and the years of experience in doing that as well. Do you, do you rely heavily on stats, Jim? Yeah. Uh, rely heavily is maybe too strong a description for it, Joe. I, I use them um, and they're important. And especially when you're talking to players, they're important. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, for example, people talk about the meters covered in, in games. Uh, and you can look at a GPS uh, metric of you know maybe somebody's covered 11k in a game. You may have touched the ball four times. You may have touched it ten times. You may have touched it twenty times. You look at some of the video analysis that you know Jim McCarry playing at centre half back had 25 touches in the first half, but all he did was lateral passes right and left. We weren't really doing anything, you know. So you've got to look at you know the stats that are there. What relevance do they have? Uh, I like to focus more on the relevant stats that they can use at half time, the live information at half time that I need to make changes in the second half. And then post game, once the proper video analysis is done, like we work on training for the following week's game. Just go go back to what Jim was saying about about the game not really changing. Right, the, the key the key principles of, of Gaelic football still remain the same. You defend well, you know, you, you need to tackle well, and, and you need to score well. You know, and those those you need a, their matchups right, etc. And you know the basics. Jim would call them like, and I think Jim, you've hit a, a core to me there. I think one of the biggest changes is is. The analysis side of things and you know over the last couple of years as you said video analysis becomes so important now there's so much analysis now and preparation on the opposition and it's nearly the copy kept thing as well so jim mcginnis wins in all ireland in 2012 and everyone everyone plays exactly like that or tries to play like that but everybody sort of got lost in the whole blanket defense thing and the defensive intensity of donegal would have brought but no one actually seen the actual offensive aspect of donegal's play that year where they were propelling massive numbers into attack but they played more of a running game rather than a kicking game as, as we know right and I think we've now got Dublin and everyone's looking at Dublin so what are they doing well they're, they're pressing kickouts and they're going zonal and they're doing this so teams are trying to replicate that but maybe losing the losing sight of what I would say Jim and this is what I see and Jim Galvin would have been a massive massive advocate of the basic skills like he always talked about our basic skills today just weren't where they should have been and they might have won by 12 points. He's talking about three or four misplaced passes. And I always feel, Jim, when you look at Dublin, they do the basics better than anyone. You know, and, and I think that that, Joe, is probably a big indication or a great starting block for a lot of club teams. You know, that, like I remember back in the day, and 
this is no word of a lie. And I remember laughing, like we used to go run up the stand dunes three nights a week with the missiles down the road, and we couldn't fucking hand pass the ball from here to the door. And like, <laughs> like, like, like it was only when you stood back, it was like, why are we not getting We can't play football. Like, we're going to run all day. Like, we're, we're finishing in half 10 and half marathons. We won't fucking win in football matches. <sighs> If you wonder, like, you know, sometimes you can get lost in the whole conditioning and analysis and stuff, and sometimes you just need to strip it back to the basics. And, and I think I think for a lot of clubs, I think a lot of clubs, uh, Jim, are missing that trick, you know, that, that focus on this on the key aspects of the game, focus on the basics, nail those, you know, get your team reasonably conditioned and have a plan and, and take it from there because you can get lost in, in so much. There is so much now, Jim, and, and the problem is as well, too, is that it's not a problem, actually. I think it's a great thing. Coaches are sharing a lot more now, Joe. So what happens is there's so much out there that people are taking bits from everything and they're trying to bring it in. And, and I always believe it. Look at what you have and, and do what fits your group best rather than trying to do something that, that you're trying to impose on a group that doesn't suit, you know? Yeah, that's true. And I mean, you look at it as well, even if, if you watch a game, I mean, what many minutes of live football is there actual football in the game uh, over a say, 76 minutes and you take a stoppage time in a game, you know, you're talking about what the balls in play 20 odd minutes, yeah. probably in, in a game end of it. And you, if you sit and look at a video analysis and you show players the full game and you expect them to come back with something uh, firm and uh, for an improvement on, uh, and really you want to get two, three key points that you focus on and you want them short, you want a 15 minute session on video analysis, which is all I would do, two, three, uh, two to three key points. Again, if you're looking at the opposition as well, two, three key points for them. And that's all they need because really, and you know, it's from the teaching end of it, Steve, you know, you get information overload with them and they don't hear anything. It's just noise all on those two or three key points on it. So you're right. You know, for me, I think that, you know, it doesn't need to be as complicated. Everybody thinks it because, you know, if I, if I in Burren now and, and people here, geez, McCoy's got this new, uh, this new device that they're wearing, you know, when they're training. Uh, and it increases the lung capacity by 50%. Like, I want to be so fit this year. What is it? Everybody wants to get it. You know, everybody wants to have the latest bit of kit. Everybody wants to have the latest style or new ways of doing things, thinking that's going to happen automatically. On. It doesn't happen just automatically because of that, you know. And I, I always use the example, if you take Jim Gavin and you propel them into Waxford or after him, would, would, they, would they win the All-Ireland? No, absolutely not. No, definitely not. Absolutely not. You know, so um, the point I'm saying is, you know, that you need to have the playing personnel with the right leadership, with all those ingredients brought in together. And the beauty of Gavin is what you're saying. He, it wasn't overly complicated with him. And that was one of the main reasons for his success. So very regimented in what he did. Obviously, the whole background from his business and the work and what he would do. Um, but he didn't overcomplicate things for that team on it. But a fantastic bunch of players um, that stuck to what was required to win the games on it and to close games out. But when you have, you know, maybe 15 players on the line that you can bring in to play equally as good as the 15 you're taking off, you're going to win championships, aren't you? Also, Jim, also a common a common trait that would have that would have uh, rang through your Kilku teams would have been uh, well, Kilku in general, I suppose as well. You couldn't fault them, and this is is that that extreme level of work rate. You know, and people people are very quick to, to point at Dublin resources, finance, facilities, all these advantages, population. By God, they work hard, Jim. You know, absolutely. Yep. Um, just moving on there a little bit, lads. Um, Stevie, you mentioned uh, you mentioned Kilku there, and Jim, of course, you uh, you you went into uh, Darren Club football. I think uh, towards the, the late nineties with with my own club, Mayo Bridge, and then. You went on to Kilku and you had excellent success uh, with Kilku. I think you have four um, you have four county championships. Um, and with Mayo Bridge, I think you have a few county championships and uh, got to an Ulster final. And unfortunately, a head-scratchy moment whereby um, I think they, they let you go or whatever. I don't know what happened. Um, but your, your time in down, in down football, down club football, very, very successful, Jim. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I have to say, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the, the club football and down. Um, we, we got two doubles with Mayo Bridge in, in the four years. In fact, the first year we got through to the uh, to the final and we're beaten by my own village here, it was Trevor. 
Uh, they got a goal later on in that game. You know, it was a final probably we should have won as well. And then we got beat um, in an Ulster final. Uh, really, uh, the bridge at that particular time um, hadn't won in a long time. And again, as we would like, I was saying with the with the Armagh seniors, uh, brought in a lot of young players. Um, you know, Darren had a great minor set at that time. You know, Danny Coulter, uh, Branton Grant, Michael Walsh, uh, Rony Saxon. You know, guys like that that were really top players, and they were brought in very very young into the team, but they were able to play at that level. And the players like Francie Pohn, you know, looking after them as well. Owen Woods. You know, great guys that would, would keep these young fellas right on it. Um, so we, we had I had good success there. Um, and again, uh, in Kilku, when we went there as well, uh, they had great work done at underage level and, and great young players coming through. Uh, and I managed to get four leagues and four championships uh, with them as well. And uh, left a very successful team that's still winning championships, which is great. And after I left the Mayo Bridge, uh, they won championships, so it wasn't... Jim McCarry won them. It was that team of uh, really good players that had developed to the point where they could continue on doing that with uh, other good managers who were coming in to take them forward. And that's a that's a good legacy that when you leave a team, they can continue on to win without you and somebody else come in and do that. So, you know, you've, you've, it's, they weren't one-offs. They weren't just there because you, it was a team that you developed. And that was important as well. So, yeah, enjoyed enjoyed all the, the clubs I was with. I was with uh, Clonduff for two years. Um, I was with Drumgath as well. I actually remember going in Drumgath. They were the first club I actually took after Armagh. And I remember they asked me to come in. I didn't want to take anybody after that for a while. And they asked me to come in and do one night a week. Um, and their ambition was to stay in the league. Um, and we ended up, I went in and done the two nights a week and we won the league. So that was the start of, the start of that, that particular one as well. But uh, yeah, thoroughly enjoyable uh, the club career. Yeah, and, and obviously there, um, I, I trained under you and, and the uh, coaching sessions were transformational for, for Mayo Bridge Club. We didn't have that type of coach before. It was, it was completely different. The training sessions were massively enjoyable. Uh, you were learning stuff all the time. And as Stevie said earlier on, you, you know, the defence started in the full forward line. And that was one of the things, you know, that you kind of instilled in that team. Yeah, I'd have to say, I mean... Uh... Stevie has got a lot, been given a lot of criticism by certain people about his defensive uh, stage and stuff on it, you know, and he's defended himself very well. And I have to say, I agree 100% with him. You know, defense has become a dirty word now, you know, in Gaelic football, because some of the so called pundits and, and their views about how the game was played whenever they played it back in the day. I played it back in the day, and it was equally as defensive in those days as well. Uh, and the great teams of the carries of this world and the dubs way back, and even watching the dubs now are probably as good a defensive team as any that's out there on it. So there's this whole um, image of, you know, if you play a blanket defense where you get guys back or your full forward gets back, tracks back and tackles yeah, and gets into defense, you know that there's something wrong with that. Every team, you know, and you hear Stevie Coton and, and writing his articles about Wooden, um, and all the great coaches will say your I mean, success is built on your defence um, and you've got to have that and it's got to be, you know, the new term now as well, it's team defence and it's team attack on it and everything's on transitions and on the breaks, you know, and closing down uh, the players. I mean, the whole, that, that is, that hasn't changed. It's maybe emphasised a bit more now, but if you take the great Terry and Kerry team and hear Pat Spillan talking about, you know, their style and they're always attacking going forward on Watch some of their games, you see how defensive they were, how defensive he was as well, coming from, from wing half back into the defence on it. But would they live with the dubs of this world, you know, or the the males um, and the carries of this world? I, I don't know, but it's, uh, you know, that whole defensive end of it, just, it's, uh, I think the fairness, Stevie, as I said, you know, maybe you've got a wee bit of a unfair criticism of that for doing that, because... Every good team, uh, as I said, their foundation is based on a really good defensive structure for players who can then take that forward to build that platform for, the, for an attacking, attacking game. I, I always find, Jim, as well, and you're totally right, I always find it's funny how the narrative in the media, you know, takes takes shape on something. Like, for example, like take Tyrone, Tyrone's new management team. They're very quick to come out to say, we'll be playing a different way and Tyrone are going to attack a lot more. You can guarantee now when Tyrone play Armagh, Monaghan and Donegal in those three National League games, they will be more than efficient. Let's be honest. Like, you know, they're not going to be men 322 to 4. It's not going to happen. 
But get the narrative out there early. You know, change the perception. Mickey was defensive. Now we've got rid of him. Now he's gone. You know, now you're going to see a really proper throw. And it'll be interesting you know, because it, 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 you, you, you buy time. It's a bit like the Ronan O'Gara one last week where he came out with this terminology in the media. KBA, you know, keep the ball alive. And the media pounced on it. It's unbelievable. What innovation from O'Gara. The next game, the next game, the ball was in play for fucking 28 minutes in his team. You know what I mean? And, and he, but he got away with it because he came out with this thing and we want to keep the ball alive, KBA. But, Jim, it's interesting because I even go back. I'm a big Man United fan. And, and I go back to Alex Ferguson. I never wanted this impression of Fergie's teams playing swashbuckling <laughs> football every single week. I was a season ticket holder for four years. And I can tell you now, many's a day, he had two banks of four and he parked the bus and played teams on the break. But he got away with it. If Sam Allardyce had done it, he was slated. You know what I mean? And Allardyce used to come out and say, oh, you know, you go to Old Trafford, you go to Chelsea and, you know, they play a long ball, but it's called a great long pass, you know. And, and it, it is true. Like, it's it's the narrative that, it, that is out there. But look, here, Jim, it, it doesn't it doesn't phase me in the slightest. But at the end of the day, you know, you, you know teams that, that you were involved in, you know, obviously, you know, I, I took Valley Holden on and, and I was there for six years at the club. And, you know, we had a different type of, of personnel around the club, you know, more of a industrious type player rather than, than a team full of massive talent, you know. And now that has changed. You know, the underage structure has brought a lot of good young lads through there. And they're obviously yeah. hopeful for the next few years they will... They will push on and start contesting, you know, at the top table. But it, it's, it's as you say, every team's different. Every priority is different. In Mayo Bridge, you'd have been demanding championships and Ulsters and the likes of that. And in other clubs, as you say, like from Yath, it's our priority is to retain our Division 1 status, stay in the league, make yourselves competitive, you know. So everybody's completely different, you know, completely different. Like, But I'll tell you what, though, Joe, one thing you talked about there and you said about Jim's time in Mayo Bridge, he still didn't sort Francis Cole's discipline problem out anyway. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, Francie's watching this. <laughs> Francie Poland was my captain and uh, <laughs> a tremendous leader. Great fan, yeah, tremendous leader, tremendous leader, and, and also a great passer, uh, Jim, when he was on the ball coming out of defense. He was able, you know, a great left foot on him, too. He could pick oh, out a good pass. Oh. No, yeah. when you stop, when you stop, he's watching that Castle Blaney game back. He's watched it back every night, he, <laughs> and every night, and he watches that Castle Blaney game because he reckons he made sixteen forward passes with a foot. He does <laughs> that. Right. But 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 Jim, he's he's he could be on the opposite sideline this year in the championship. He's in with Fanny and and uh, in Longstone. Oh, is that good right? Man, good management team there. Good management team there. Very good. Very good. Yeah. yeah look forward to the challenge. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, lads, uh, just um, just moving on. Actually, there, Jim, I was just going to ask you, um, when you do go to a new club, do you have a set way of playing or do you look at the players that you have and, and kind of play to the strengths of the players or is it just one way that you have a plan? No, I mean, I, I think it would be very foolish if I was going in in trends and saying this was, they're going to play like this um, and that's, that's it. Um, Obviously, what, what I've done is I've looked at uh, past games um, just to get a feel of the way they've been playing. Uh, we haven't really, like, we've, genuinely, we've had one week of work, so I'm really only seeing them on the field. Although we've done plenty of Zoom work in, in yeah. terms of all those things, to be uh, developing our values, looking back on past performances, how we can improve our style of play and different things. But, I mean... That's something I that will develop, and it may not just develop in, in a short space of time. It may say, take a, a while for that actually to develop. So, um, I mean, I wouldn't win with a fix. This is the way we're going to play. Um, but I would have a number of different uh, views about how we're going to approach games and what my expectations are of them as a panel of players, both on and off the field within the community, but also on the field, uh, and how I would expect them to attend the training, prepare training, prepare for games on it. So I'll be very fixed in my views on the likes of that and the preparation end of it, but in terms of how we're actually going to play, as Stevie was alluding to earlier, I mean, uh, so many games now, you're, you're making different uh, stages. You may well get somebody, as Stevie said, that parks the bus where the league won up and everybody's behind the ball and you have to break that down. You get other teams that might go more man-to-man -man with you and be more attacking oriented. Right so... We've got to be able to play against all different styles and play for different scenarios. We want to get in games where we're a man down or we need a point in the last five minutes to get a free. So a lot of things to work on. And it's early days. So we've had what, <laughs> five training sessions so far. So it's early days and that'll develop as we move through the year. And Jim, you yourself, do you uh, do you take, even, even though you're manager, do you take most of the coaching session or, or 
do you get someone else to do that now? Are you still hands on with the coaching? Yeah, I'm, ha- I'm hands on with the coaching, but I don't take it all. Um, uh, within within Boron, I uh, have Stevie O'Hare and Owen McCartan, who took the underage teams right through to the successful um, also championship. So they're in with those young fellas coming through, uh, developing them into their squad as well. And uh, Garoid Adams is back in again. He was in last year with Paddy. Um, because of COVID and the break, really didn't get a full year. So I asked Garoid to stay on. And he's a tremendous coach. So I have three uh, really good coaches with me. And what we do is we divide the session up. So I, I set the theme of what I want them to work on. Um, and they'll develop their own drills for that. And then obviously we finish off with the game and a play and what we're doing and that. So uh, very much on a, everybody has the same voice as I have. Everybody will have the same input as I have on it. Although the final decision obviously will have to rest with me because uh, my head's in the chopping block, so to speak. So, um, but yeah, that's the way I would operate. I, I still get involved, still get the boots on, still take the, the drills, still... Uh, referee or, or coach referee games as part of it and then really enjoy that I think as a manager you lose an awful lot uh, if you don't do that I think if you're standing on the line you know and you're not involved that aspect that Stevie talked about you know uh, being with the players um, sorry lads uh, being with the players and being able to um, engage with them and uh, have that crack with them and that camaraderie and let them see that you care and you're there and you're willing to roll the sleeves up with the boots on and get stuck in. I think that's a massive thing for any manager to have on it. And I'll always do that as long as I'm coaching. Gride's a good lad, Jim. Yeah. Yeah, Gride's a good lad. I have a lot of time for Gride. Good lad. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And absolutely. He's, yeah. He's, got, he's got plenty of experience, you know, from his own club. With St. John, yes. and also obviously he's managed it at the county level, you know. So to get someone in at club level coaching who's actually managed it at the county level is a huge, it's a huge advantage. Yeah. It's yes. a great experience for the lads, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jim, yeah. You, you mentioned coaching referee in there. A lot of our uh, listeners and viewers be interested in in that approach. What what's coaching referee? Well, I mean, it's it's the same as coaching from the sideline. Only I referee the game, so we're having in house game at the end. So we do a 50% session that's based on the drill sets and then we play the game and apply those drills in the game. I referee the game, but I coach it as I go along. So I'll be calling players and tell them what to do as part of that. So you're refereeing, but you're actually coaching while you're doing it. And you do see the game so much. That it's like a lot of the coaches now up in the stand looking down and you see it differently. You do see it differently because I spent a lot of time this year with Arma up in the stand watching with the COVID mm-hmm. rather than being on the line. You get a different perspective from when you're higher up, but you also get a different perspective when you're in among them uh, and you're hearing them more and you're engaging more with them and that as well. So when I say a coach and referee, and that's what I mean, you're actually coaching as you referee that game rather on the sideline call um, the different moves. And then Joe, Joe, closer to the championship, what, what all these guys do now is they bring a referee in and a few quid and that get him to referee the game and then just hope that he's refereeing them in the championship. <laughs> It's not happening down. It's not happening down. You've got to give me a few well, those games. Well, I tell you what, right? It doesn't happen to me because Neil Cousins used to deliver my post, right? Paul Falloon cut my grass and the fuckers give me nothing when they were refereeing me. So it doesn't, it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll be seeing the referees up and born soon. <laughs> oh, hey, listen. All joking, all joking aside, man. Listen, I, I've, I've a newfound respect for it because I'll tell you, it's, it's a hard gig and some of the carry on, you know, you do... As a referee, like there's no re- no referee, no game, you know, and, and there's obviously a shortage of them across the country, particularly down. But I have to say, like you know, the majority of them, majority of them, I have no problem with, like you know, and, and it's a hard job, Jim. It's a hard job because, and I think that the, I think the juggling Joe as well, the juggling of the rules doesn't help things. Like even training the other night, I, I had actually for a split second, I had actually forgot about the mark rule. Do you know what I mean? Like you actually, mm-hmm. you know, and you're thinking, you know, it's. Like, for a referee to see all that in real time, lads, and the way the pace of the game is... Like, Jim, the pace of the game's improved so much now, and it's got a lot higher. Even at the top club level, like, if Gordon are playing Kilku or Warren Point or one of the top club teams, like, that game's going to be played at 100 miles an hour. And a referee is, you know, of, of, of everything, and he's looking for the fouls, he's looking for off the ball, tackle, he's looking for the marks, where the ball was kicked. You know, I, I think it's very unfair on them, the rule changes. I really do. I think it's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, just with referees, Jim, what, what approach do you give to referees? Do you, do you tell your players to keep quiet, don't say anything, or do you say, oh, you can't try to maybe manipulate the referee, try to cajole him? What would your approach be? 
What would your message so, be? Of a very simple approach, the, the two things you ain't going to change is the scoreline and the referee at the end of the game. Um, and I mean, I, I would probably have a reputation of not being very proactive with referees in terms of antagonizing one way or other or trying to influence them because I don't really think it makes a degree of difference with them. Um, you know, Kieran McGinney and I had a different view on that. Um, and everybody's entitled to their views on it. But I, I just think, you know, really, you know, have you ever seen a referee change a decision from anyone trying to change from verbally shouting out from the side or players to anything? Never happens, yet we still go at them all the time on it. And that's what I love about watching the rugby. Um, you know, you, you see they have that respect and they get on it because they're not going to make any difference, make the change. Now you can influence them. Yep, yeah, absolutely. You can influence the referee by what you do, but you never get them to change a decision by bad manners, mouthing, whatever. So, I mean, I, I don't really engage that in it, and I don't encourage the players to engage in that negativity with the referee. I don't think it serves any purpose whatsoever in the game. Okay. Um, brilliant. Right, lads, we'll just move on. Jim, I've got uh, four or five questions here. Um, I know we, we don't have too long left, uh, so I just wanted to ask you a few of them here. Um, okay. Is, is there a right or wrong way to coach? Yeah, um, the, there's no, every, every coach has his own particular style of how he goes about it. And the, the right way to coach is when players enjoy what they're doing. They enjoy the drills you do, the way you set the games up in the in-house games. They enjoy, they want to be a team. Like you said, whenever I was at Bale Bridge, you know, it was different every night. It was so enjoyable, we learned so much more, but it was fun. You know, and as I said, you know, players play with their club because they have their mates there and it's enjoyable and it's fun and they want to win. You know, so if you're if you're achieving that, that players have a smile on their face and they're enjoying it and you get what you want as a coach in terms of the improvements and not necessarily just winning, but the improvements in the player that helps towards winning that end of it. Whatever way you do that, that is right. Um and I, I don't get into the, the big heavy. I, Conor Laffey would say to me in the, in the time I was with uh, Kilku, he heard me really lose it. You could count in one hand a number of times, he heard me lose it. He says, but when you did, we fucking cleared the room. Excuse the language, but we cleared the room when you did. But it was, you could count in one hand in all those years a number of times that I actually lost it. But I didn't need to, need to um, because it, what, the way it was working um, for me. So... Yeah, right and wrong, there are different styles of doing it, but as long as players are enjoying what they're doing and they're coming back um, and they're developing as players and there's fun that they're full of and they're, they're training with a smile on their face, that to me is the right way of doing it. Any thoughts on that, Stevie? Yeah, I agree with Jim on the wall banging stuff, Joe. I, I spoke to a number of players last year. I did a wee, I did a wee, uh, pull, or a wee uh, Zoom uh, on the... did a wee Zoom, actually, for the, the five hours at halftime with Paul McVenny, actually. And we did what players wanted to hear at halftime, you know, and what, what players' experiences were at halftime. And one of the things, actually, uh, Joe, that we that we talked about, one of the things we talked about was, uh, well, we actually spoke to three different inter-county players from three different provinces, and we spoke to three different club players from three different provinces. And the, the resounding message came back, Joe, that it was quite simple. Players wanted clarity on the instructions. You know, they wanted three or four clear coaching points that they would take out on the field with them. And one of the quotes from the player was very interesting. It says, like, if a player, if a manager, like Jim has just rightly said there now, if a manager loses the head and, and is trying to motivate you by, by squealing and shouting and roaring all the time, if he's doing that all the time, then it loses its value. You know, it loses its value pretty quickly. You know, and, and as Jim rightly said there, like, he could count the amount of times in one hand that he lost that he lost the head with the boys. And it's exactly the same. You know, I would have taken the exact same approach myself because it doesn't, it loses its value. Do you know what I mean, Joe? You know, and, and I think players just want two or three key coaching points before they go out. And I've been asked before in the past, uh, uh, club level, county level, where you've been speaking to the players and some of them just said, Stevie, can you just reinforce those two or three key points again for everyone? Just, and, and I like that because it means that the players are clearly thinking, right, what are the three key? So it might be, Right, our kickouts, their kickouts. You know, when we win the ball, when we lose the ball, it could be something simple. You know, but but the, as Jim said, the the wall banging approach it'll work, and it, and 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 you need it now and again. You know, but a lot seldom, a lot seldom rather than regularly. 
So, so, so a few, a few short points. I think it goes back to the point that Jim was making earlier on about, you know, giving too much information to players, information overload. And then when it comes to game day, they, they, they don't perform. Uh, just moving on there, uh, Jim, a couple of more, a couple more questions. Um, what's the most difficult part of coaching? Uh, most difficult part is the decision you make when you can't play uh, players who have given everything to you in training. Um, like whenever we were looking at the start uh, within Burn, there were something like 96 players put their name forward to be involved this year. Now that's 96 players. That's not 96 want to play for the senior team. Maybe they do, but obviously it's not going to be 86 in the squad. In. You know, um, so across the board, it was 96 players uh, put their name forward to be involved in it. Um, I can play 15, start 15 players. I can use 20. And I'm not sure down if you're allowed, uh, Stevie will know this, if you're allowed, what are you allowed, 28, Stevie? Out, uh, champs at times, 30, even allow you 30. I, th you I know, think it's 28, Jim, yeah. 28, yeah, you know, so, uh, so you're leaving guys who have trained with you, you know, you have a squad, maybe if you work on a squad, of even you've got 35, 36 in a squad, which is a sort of decent number, considering when you have knocks and stuff, you can still have a decent game and training. You know, you're going to leave guys behind who can't even strip out, but you're leaving guys behind then who aren't going to get playing. And that's probably the hardest thing for me is guys who have busted themselves all year. If you're a genuine fellas on and off the field and you can't include them, that's probably the hardest thing for me as a coach, uh, making that type of decision on it. When you know you've no real reason not to play them other than you know Jim McCarry is a better player than Stevie Poacher so he's getting his place you know but I have to leave him off and how do you approach that Jim do you sit down and talk to the player before well beforehand do you go through the reasons why they're not starting or what way absolutely yeah. I mean I mean it's there there are there are players who are very very dedicated never miss and will always be there at training uh, and remember I'll give you an example even I remember two brothers coming to me in Kilku uh, and one of them said, you know, why can't our Stevie uh, get his place in the team? He never misses. You know, he works hard in the training. You know, uh, he can score and stuff on it. And I says, yeah, he's very, very good. And I says, but, you know, you're getting your place. He was getting his place and the brother wasn't. And I said, then, well, you know, on a scale of one to ten, where are you at the moment? And you're getting your place. And he says, I think I'm about a seven. And I says, well, I'd have you about maybe an eight or a nine. That's how good you are. I says, no. On a scale of one to ten, where do you see in yourself? I said to his brother, and his brother said, probably about a four or five. So I looked at his other brother and I said to him, then, does that answer? And he says, yeah, that's answered. And they walked away. You know, so it was explaining to them the, the logic. And that's yeah. most players accept it when you explain it to them properly and they know your rationale and your reason for it. On it. They may not always be happy they may, because, in the end, mm -hmm. if Steve and I have both done all the sessions, the whole way from the start of the year, we've done our strength condition, we're looking after ourselves, we're playing really well in training. You were both going strong, and I have to make that decision on it. I decide that Stevie's playing and I'm not playing, then you know, I'm not going to be happy with that, but I have to respect that a decision has been made on it. You know? So it's explained it whether you know, nine times out of ten they will accept it reluctantly, but it has to be done. And if you communicate well and you come out of your players, you should be able to, to do that. Is that, would you agree with that, Stevie? Is that the way? I, I wouldn't add too much to that, except just to really back up what Jim's last word there, communication, Joe. Communication is just so vital. It's the same in teaching. If your message is mixed, if your message is contradictory, if your message is not consistent, kids pick up on it. You know, why is he getting off at a nine knot? You know, why, why is he allowed to do this and I'm not? That's the exact same with coaching. You know, regardless of the ability, the perceived ability of the player or the perceived reputation of the player, you know, everyone, everyone has to be doing communicated with, valued, and it has to be a consistent message. And that's something that I've always admired in the likes of Jim there because he's, he's had big personalities to deal with, both at club level and county level. It's not easy. I've experienced it myself. And it's a very, very important part of the game. And you try to be as consistent and as fair and, and communicate with, with them as best you possibly can. And sometimes that's still not enough, Joe. You know, and, and listen, you know, I know it was touched at the, at the start there about my own decision to step away from club football. And... I've really, during lockdown, really re-evaluated where my time has gone. And I enjoy coaching. And I've been a manager of Van Rijk for three years, for Ballyhole for six. You know, I, I've only ever managed two clubs before Bransford. You know, that was nine years in managing at senior level. And, you know, short time in comparison to Jim. 
but I've coached at, at every other level and I just find I just find coaching gym much more enjoyable. The management for me is it's become very, very difficult, Joe. It's become very difficult. You're dealing with so many aspects. You know, you're dealing with committees, you're dealing with players, you're, you're contacting players, players are contacting you all the time. You know, it's just it, it's a it's a completely time draining job. It really is. And and I'm not saying that I didn't know that. I, I knew that of course, but I just think I just think it, it's it people have no People sometimes do have no perception of the time that goes into it. It really is so time consuming. And I'll tell you, Joe, probably as well mentally and emotionally draining that, that you don't even realize, you know, that you actually, it's draining you, but you don't realize it, you know. And, and I, I think you move it forward for me personally. I, I think the management can, can be parked for a while for me. That's the truth, you know. Uh, Jim, you've, you've done both, obviously, uh, coaching and management. I've just recently come from, from the Ormah County team. Uh, would, you, would you rather be a coach or a manager? Yeah, I think there's an awful lot of living in what, what Stevie has said. I mean, um, I had, uh, right up until I went in with Kieran, I'd been a manager. I'd been the manager all my life. I hadn't been a assistant manager. I've been the manager coach, because that I said I'd have done both, but I'd have been the person that was dealing with committees, as Stevie said, organising transport organising gear, uh, getting the kit and all sort of actually been doing all sorts of, of uh, roles as a manager, as well as trying to do the main thing, which is to coach the players and develop them as players on it. Um, and then Kieran asked me to come in. He actually asked me to come in actually the year that I, I, I took part with cancer, got the kidney cancer. He asked me to come in that year and I couldn't do it because of that. I was actually, he asked me, I was going to the operation on the Monday and I met him the Thursday before and I hadn't told anybody about it so he didn't know and he said look Jim maybe come in the following year everything goes well I'll ask you back and thought no more about it think look you're not somebody else in. and that happened and for a I'm like he's true to his word he came back he said Jim you know everything's went well you're healthy will you consider coming back in and I did so I went on assistant manager level and that was, that was a it wasn't a culture shock for me but I knew what I was going into because I'd made that conscious decision that that's what suited me at that time with the health and everything that I didn't want to do all the run about that Stevie's talking about. Kieran was doing all he deeds with committee. You know, I went with a system on a lot of this stuff, but he was the one getting 99% of the calls, making 99% of the arrangements. And in fairness to him, he was very hands-on. So he didn't he didn't load an awful lot onto me to do all that extra stuff. So I was able to do the coaching end of it on a system and uh, do as, as best I could in that role. Now it's flipped again back to where it was and now I went the opposite of Steely so it's all the arrangements that you're organising but because you're in a new club that's all new and it's exciting you know and you're meeting different people I love being with people I mean lockdown killed me because it, you know I'm a people's person I play golf I like it out in the golf course with people I love coaching being involved with people so all that sort of went but now you know there's a it's a change at the minute because it's new and you're in and you're dealing with all these people. So I would say maybe after, as, as Stevie Wright, he says, after a period of time, then when it starts to take its toll and get you down again, you reevaluate where you're at. Um, and Stevie's made that decision to coach more than manage. I went the opposite way, but I'm enjoying it at the moment and we'll, we'll see what way that develops. Brilliant. Uh, just one or two more, more questions, Jim. Um, you, you've seen a lot of changes in coaching. Uh, what do you think coaching will look like in 10, 15 years' time? Wow, 10, 15 years time. Well, I, I tell you what it'll look like. I'll, I'll be behind a wire um, with a walking stick um, and a dog and a cloth cap and a pipe. <laughs> and Poacher will be on the line. And I'll shout abuse at him from the start of the day. <laughs> I can assure you, I, I will not be. I can tell you. I, 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 I'm trying to get. I'm trying to get the handicap closer to dots so we get on the earth. <laughs> <laughs> what what it look like, Joe? I mean, uh, it'll change again. It's like all these. I mean, there's change all the time. Uh, and if um, Galway come back now, Galway's a fairly good side and they're, they're close enough. But if Galway come in with a new method and a new way of doing something, that you know, the Jim McGinnis one that Stevie referred to, or the Jim Gavin way. With the successful double side, you'll see teams changing again. And will the style of football change again? Will it go back to the old uh, carry ways and stuff like that? No, I don't think so. But there will be there will be change to it again. It will be innovation, um, and we'll see changes. You know, the All Blacks philosophy or the uh, you know the the wooden way from the basketball or whatever. You'll see different things coming back into it again on it. But you know, the basics will still be the same. Some real changes will probably happen, 
that'll make no impact on the game whatsoever. In fact, would probably lessen the impact of the game as these ones do and create problems for referees, as Stevie's referred to. Uh, but there will be changes, but nothing, I would say, is dramatic. Uh, Jim, you mentioned there, you know, uh, probably the game could be going back to more of an attacking style. I know that there are, there are videos there on YouTube of you, uh, RMA videos of you working with defenders from a long time ago, those tackling challenges, you know, <clears> the <throat> one situations. Do you think those are now becoming more important? Oh, well, I mean, as we said earlier, I mean, there's, there's defence and there's attack in all sport. And you have your transitions to both. But if you look at the modern game of Gaelic football and you look at the scores, the scores, even though people are saying in the outside world, you look at the, the games and they're so defensive and they're, 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 they're less attacking and they're not as good as what they are. There's more scores in games now than there ever was in all games. There's more goals from the score. There's more points from the score. You know, now, obviously, there's, you know, you're, you're seeing structure, you're seeing that sort of defensive shape more. So people talk about the flag of defensive, all sorts of different variations on that. Uh, but I actually think football's better now. I enjoy it more. I like to see it, a team being able to defend. I like to see a double teaming and a tackle and win that ball back and going for the attack and driving forward on it. I mean, I hate teams that lose possession and give it away, a shitty ball away. And uh, I hate teams, you know, that are constantly taking shots from wrong position and, and not scoring on it. But, you know, the bottom line is you really do have to have good defensive structures, as I said earlier, in order to have that attacking in it. But there isn't that much wrong with Gaelic football on it. There are an awful lot of people just like to have a critical view. I mean, some of the guys, I wonder what they're like in their, in their real lives, you know, if this is what they are in their commentating lives, and everything's always, the glass is half empty so much, you know, everything's always down on, on teams, you know, so I don't know, I mean, maybe it's just me, maybe I'm just getting too old now, this wee white beard, you know, maybe I'm starting to get too cynical in the old age, you know. Um, it's interesting you say that because I had a conversation there the other night, actually, the following along the other night, and we were watching, it was Sunday, actually, and we watched the two games on Sunday, the soccer, right? Uh, the first game was, uh, who was the first game? Can't even remember. It was that. It was that in Troll, and I can't even remember. It was Tottenham. And, it was. It was Tottenham and Southampton, right? And the second game was, or not Tottenham, Southampton. It was, uh, here, regardless of what it was, the second game was Man United and Burnley, and they were horrific games, absolutely horrific games. And I was saying to him, you know something? You're exposed that much football now that you know it's hard to actually remember when's the last time you watched a brilliant game of football. And I think Gaelic's the same. We're very critical, but we watch that much of it now. We're exposed to that much of it now. Big. Like, Park TV had nearly every game under the sun last year. You know, you could watch whatever game you wanted to watch. And I think, as you said, Jim, I completely agree. I think we're super critical at times. And you go back and there's been some brilliant games, some absolutely yeah. brilliant games over the last few years, you know, particularly in the qualifiers. And I think, you know, we've, we've probably missed a bit of a trick because I, I think our Ulster, I think, you know, the, the provinces have probably served their purpose at this stage here now and they're not as competitive. Like, if you're looking at Donegal or Down, for Donegal and Down to win an Ulster Championship, they have, to, they have to beat each other. Then they have to beat Derry. Then they have to beat the winners of Tyrone or Cavan. And then they have to beat the winners of, of Fermanagh and Monaghan or Armagh or Antrim. You know, so like it's it's just an absolute minefield, you know. And, and, and by the time they get to Crow Park, they're punch drunk. So the provincials are completely are completely imbalanced. Whereas Kerry could win an all Ireland win in three games, you know. So it doesn't it, it doesn't make sense for me. So I think that that's, that's something that needs to be looked at. Because I think if you, had, if you imagine, Jim, if you, had the, if you went to the 32 in the hat and you pulled you know, Dublin away to down in the first round, Kerry away to Tyrone. Like, you know, imagine the buzz about those places. Imagine the hype, you know, and, and just something different, you know. I think that's what we're missing, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, even the point you were saying just about the league, Stevie, as well, you know, that, you know, they play, they play one, one game in the league, you know, uh, but the league, and everybody says the league is the best football to watch. It's where the excitement is, you know, and obviously everybody wants to win their provincial Everybody wants an Ulster, you know, everybody wants to win an All Ireland. Yes, you can still have that as your knockout end on an open draw basis. But if you had your league games, your seven league games home and away, there's 14 games, there's income for the county, there's enjoyment for the fans, there's more games per training session for, for the players. And we talked about that ratio. So it's a, it's a far better, more exciting, and it would fit in to the schedule. Part of the problem is you look at the way they spread the games out, and you talk about, you know, and and Munster, you know, the short number of games they have and they go on to win all Ireland from that end. But 
and the number of games we but they draw them out over so long. And if you could dance them more as well, you can get a lot more games played within that period. But obviously there's TV rights and there's the season and all that all the things taken into account, but it can be done. Yeah. Okay. Um just um one last question, uh Jim. Uh, you've been brilliant with your time. Um you mentioned golf <laughs> earlier on. What, what is that the type of thing that you would do kind of get a, to get away from the football? How would you how do you sort of de stress or whatever? Yeah, I mean, golf golf would be uh, would be probably the main one for me over the years of, of playing golf. Uh, I wouldn't be a low handicapper. I wouldn't be great at it, but uh, I find it really enjoyable. Um, again, there was always great camaraderie on the golf course, you know, and play we a better club competition. I really enjoy that aspect of probably more than even the club competitions themselves. Um, we've got a wee dog a couple of years back. The daughter was back home from Australia and convinced the mommy to get a dog for Christmas. So... Uh, living in Restraver here, you know, around Kibroni Park and up over the forestry, you know, there's plenty of walking done. And uh, probably my dog knows more about coaching than maybe I do at the minute because that's all I talk to him about <laughs> when I'm out walking. Um, and since I retired from the, I retired from the council five years ago, I was there 32 years working here in more council. So we have more time on my hands and uh, we've been a garden and stuff, all the things you like to do. I have a grandchild back over from Australia. I have another one due um, in June. And another one over in, in Perth in Australia. So, um, yeah, th- those are the important things. And I have to say, after all the years of coaching and involved in football that I love and that football family that I love, you know, I think one of the key messages for any coaches is never lose the main family focus, you know, that you can go out and coach every night of the week and be successful at what you do on it. But your own family at home is the most important thing in life. Right? And that, that's probably a key message. I would say the football family is great. Fantastic, and they've br- been brilliant to me. Times of bereavement, times of sickness, um, but you know the main thing is your own family at home is the most important thing of the whole lot. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. And that's that's a that's a great way to end it, uh, Jim. Uh, thanks very much uh, for coming on the show, Jim. Uh, you've been a wealth of knowledge and expertise there. Great to have you on the show. Um, okay, so uh, thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you in the locker room in two weeks' time. Thank you. <laughs>